So this week I'm going to be showing you the making of a 1930s evening dress from Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion. So Janet Arnold studied historical dress and tried to make a record of it including drawing out patterns to scale and making notes on how the clothes were made. A, a wonderful resource for historical and vintage costumers. But I was relieved to see a fellow YouTuber, I can't remember who, but saying the sizing isn't always strictly accurate because I'm going to make <laughs> this pattern here. I didn't scale it up myself because I was so nervous of it. I took it to, you know, one of those kind of printers and they scaled it up and they were, I know, very accurate. And yet, uh, when I made the mock up, the front part of the dress, which, so it has this very tricky construction where the front, an interesting construction according to Janet Arnold, where the front wraps all the way round from front to back and you have to uh, cut out the dress, this huge shape on the bias, and it's all one piece, except of course the fabric width, there's no way that any fabric is wide enough, so you have to then piece uh, <laughs> another bias cut bit to make this enormous shape. And it goes from front to back, kind of over your hips and joins at the back. Now I haven't got the widest hips in the world, but even so, it literally, the bit that was supposed to go from front to back, literally just went round the front of my hips. <laughs> and uh, although I can imagine the original wearer of the dress would be potentially taller than me because the dress was too long when I made it, I can't think that the hips were half as <laughs> narrow as mine. So I had to do several mock ups, and the shape basically started out like this and then got even stranger to look something like this. <laughs> but that actually seemed to work. And I'm sure you'll know that the tricky thing about 30s bias cut dresses, they look really simple. Like if you watch The Great Sewing Bee, you'll remember Claire Bradders, Claire Bradders, uh, one with a 30s evening dress, which looked a lot more simple than some of the other dresses in the finals. But simple yet very tricky because the shape has to fall so that it doesn't cling. I mean the bias cut kind of drapes it over your figure so it shouldn't be too loose but neither should it be tight in any area either and there's no darts, there's no, there's like one seam, there's no waistband, frills, flounces to cover up any mistakes so once you've cut it you pretty well can't alter it. There's no darts or seams to alter it with. Basically, nowhere to hide or <laughs> bodge over any little accidents. So the simplicity of it is actually its trickiness. Um, isn't it? Yes, it is. So the dress itself <laughs> the dress itself is like a mid the dress itself is a classic mid 30s evening dress so with this simple bias cut sort of sweep of fabric at the front and then which is also very characteristic of the 30s this very dramatic back like plunging back yes yes if you're being practical and thinking hmm how do I wear a bra? It is a problem. So, plunging back and uh, and then down the back is attached this fishtail, Janet Arnold calls it, which, which is a good description. And it's a fishtail of 50 ruffles in all. They all progress in size to give this kind of effect of this like mermaid-like 
fishtail and that attaches to the back of the dress with poppers so the drama which is as I say quite characters of the 30s the drama is actually not in the front of the dress it's in the back of the dress so you can make a dramatic <laughs> stop <laughs> so that you can make a dramatic exit so this is definitely the trickiest dress I've ever sewn and I'll show you how I went about it. Oh, and there was just one more thing that I wanted to say, which is if you wanted to have a go yourself, I do believe that all Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion books have recently been republished by the School of Historical Dress, I think. I mean, I've had mine since, since I did theatre wardrobe at the Modern Art School. I was 19. <laughs> Pardon me any time ago at all. So yeah, I've had mine since then. So, yeah, I think they might not have been available for it, but they're available now, which is maybe a good sign. Maybe it means that historical and vintage dressmaking is taking off. She did document some really wonderful dresses. There's one from the 1920s I want to have a go at too, actually. So uh, anyway, <laughs> off I go. I bought this red silk taffeta from the House of Silk in London's Fabric District and after three mock-ups to get the shape of the dress right I cleared the kitchen floor because it's so huge that I needed all this space and I set about cutting out this enormous shape on the bias with the help of Pixie as my fabric weight and you can see there I'm just piecing the extra part of the dress that you just can't get from the width and is actually shown in Janet Arnold's diagram that you will need to piece that extra part of the skirt or obviously also on the bias and cut out the front and back bodice pieces which are actually tiny and here I'm cutting out the ruffles and the back piece of the dress where the fishtail of ruffles is to be attached and that's placed in the centre back and that huge shape I'm just showing you that folds round and the fishtail kind of panel where the ruffles to be attached is stitched onto it and then this is the front bodice piece which just folds round to the back like that and then there are tiny little back pieces which are stitched on just to the back there and uh, at, attached at the shoulder seams on each side just like that and then the front bodice is attached to the dress around that curve just as I'm showing here and then it's on to cutting out all the ruffles and as you can see there are a lot of them and they're all labelled right and left and they are in kind of graduating sizes and also graduating shapes and there were so many of them I think there were 50 in all and I actually kept losing one or two during the course of making this dress and the really strange thing is that they've never turned up I don't know if there were like little mice in my cottage wearing little red silk taffeta dresses but it's the only explanation I can think of and there are small ruffles across the shoulders of the dress and down the bodice back and then they graduate becoming larger and larger and then form a big train at the back of the dress and the last pieces to cut out were the waistband for the dress and the bow which attaches to the centre of it and the pieces for the bow are cut out on the bias and even as I brought down all the ruffles from the loft to finish the edges some had already gone missing so what I did was to turn under and then turn under again the hem of each ruffle press it and then stitch it down in position Pixie joined me in the sewing room but didn't find any of this especially interesting and then you can see how many ruffles there were 23L I think there were 25 on each side so yes 50 in all and then the panel for the fishtail of ruffles I'm just cutting down into the center to form an opening which I'll finish the edges of and then that um, just has hooks and eyes attached to form a fastening 
and then it was time to stitch all the ruffles together and as you can see I had kept all the pattern pieces pinned to them and that is because if I didn't have say 18L or 15R pinned to each ruffle I certainly wouldn't have had any idea <laughs> where it fitted into this long trail of ruffles I'm sure there's a better word for it than trail fishtail that was the word so I'm just going to pin and stitch all these ruffles together and this stage was such a relief because I thought finally there wouldn't be ruffles going missing they would be held down and then it was time to attach my stream of ruffles to the dress so I started at the front bodice and all the corners of the ruffles are mitered and stitched because they form a kind of zigzag shape as they go around and just referring to the Janet Arnold the parts of the ruffle that attach to the bodice are piece, pieces 14 to 25 so 25 are the smallest ruffles and they begin sort of under the arms at the front of the bodice and then extend round to the back of the bodice gradually increasing in size and where the ruffles meet the fishtail at the back there's an overlapping piece which has poppers stitched to it so that the dress can be opened at the back waist area and then the lowest part of the fishtail fits around two large centre triangles that form a tray. I'm just pointing these out on uh, Janet Arnold's diagram. And then the left and right pieces with their mitered corners are fitted together. And this is actually quite tricky. They, they don't um, fit together in a kind of nice, neat way as one would hope so you can see I'm just fitting them together carefully and then I'm going to pin and I stitch them by hand because it was pretty fiddly that's just it all pinned together before I start my hand stitching and then this is just to show you how the ruffles fit across the bodice with these zigzag shapes of the ruffles top stitched over the shoulder straps of the bodice and then hand stitching the mitered corners of the ruffles for the skirt fishtail together and then I pinned the tail piece where the ruffles are going to be attached to the centre back of the skirt before stitching that in place and Janet Arnold's notes show that the ruffles are attached to the tail piece just at little points down the tail piece here and there and then the last thing for the dress was to form the waistband with the bow so the two pieces for the bow are cut on the bias and then there is a long strip for the waistband which is literally just uh, doubled over stitched and turned right side out and then the bow has gathering stitches down the center it's folded in like that the edges are neatened and then the gathers pulled up to create that bow and then this center part is pleated so here we are with the bow uh, edges uh, stitched together, um, the raw edges finished and the gathering stitches down the centre. And then the pleated piece, you take that and you twist it to wrap it around the bow and the twist forms a sort of extra decorative kind of centerpiece to the bow and then that's just stitched in place and then stitched onto the waistband and then the waistband is completed with poppers and the dress is ready and the horizontal format of YouTube doesn't really lend itself to showing off a dress so I thought for this dress I would show you the back and front views at the same time rather than just showing you a large sweep of my living room and 
one thing that I didn't document for some reason for the front of the dress was just on that little bodice area. There are three little tucks in the centre that are just top stitched in place. But otherwise, you can see this is a pretty dramatic <laughs> dress. And I think the 1930s are fascinating because, of course, this dress, the original, is in the Victorian Albert Museum. It's not actually on display, sadly. It must be in the archive somewhere. But it's amazing that this dress was designed and worn in the mid-30s when the Great Depression meant that people were often leading pretty drab lives. But, of course, what it meant was that they looked to Hollywood and the wonderful, glamorous Hollywood stars of the time who wore dresses like these. And you could certainly escape from a dreary reality by going to the cinema and uh, looking at uh, wonderful stars like uh, Joan Crawford or Veronica Lake or Betty Davis, Greta Garbo or Marlene Dietrich, of course, can't miss them out. It was a time when people escaped from a rather grim reality into a wonderful Hollywood fantasy and I think this dress is all about that particular 30s mood. Thank you so much for watching and if you'd like to see more dressmaking and needlecrafts from the early part of the 20th century I concentrate a lot on the 1930s and 40s as I want to take in probably the whole year from the 1900s to 1960s so I hope you'll join me for more sewing adventures and it does really help me if you would like this video and I'm always very touched by people subscribing so I hope you'll consider that too and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye from Pixie too. <laughs>